Today, I am excited to invite you to our Lunch with Docs program. We're going to be talking about the dangerous drops. So we're going to be talking about a condition called neurogenic orthostatic hypotension or NOH and what that is and um, get a whole like understanding of the symptoms and treatments and everything that you would ever want to know so that if you might experience these symptoms or your loved one does, then you're able to have a conversation with your doctor. Make sure that you recognize this is something that you need to let your doctor know about. Um, I want to go ahead and invite you to open up your chat box. And we always have an early adopter. Nick is always the first one hot on the trail giving us a shout out he is in Valencia California and he's struggling with 104 degree temperatures out there with 65 percent relative humidity and that's kind of unique for uh California uh to have that much humidity I think so give us a shout out let us know where you're joining us from um and I am going to introduce our speaker so with us today is Dr. Salima Broman you might recognize her because she is one of our regulars one of our PMD Alliance partners uh, we love having Dr. Broman on and this is an area that I love having her talk about because she's just it flows off of her her knowledge about this um, and her passion for um, helping people understand this as well as other symptoms of Parkinson's is something that she's just passionate and gifted of so you are in for a treat so I am going to welcome Dr. Broman and we actually don't have slides today this is actually going to be conversation conversational style and I'm going to be watching the chat for your questions and we'll intersperse those questions so they won't have to be held until the end. So if they're relevant to what she is talking about, I will add those in. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to spotlight her so everyone doesn't have to search for her in the tiny boxes. She's right there bold and beautiful in front of us. So welcome Dr. Broman. Thank you. Thank you so much for that kind introduction. And thank you, everybody, for joining. And I hope this is um, educational for you. And, and like uh, Anissa said, please do ask questions. Um, this is I, I, a very um, important topic in terms of a non um, with sins and something that really can be helped. Uh, but if people have to know about it, of course, um, like any symptom of Parkinson's. Um, so we're going to take a deep dive about what NOH is and how it can affect people, how we can treat it, and um, and really the importance of bringing it to the attention of your of your healthcare provider if you're having any of these symptoms. And the symptoms can be very vast. So we're going to talk about all of that. So thank you. Awesome. So. Mm -hmm. All right, well, let's start at the very beginning and let's talk about what NOH actually is. And some people may have heard of orthostatic hypotension. So can you talk about that, what the difference is and what the N stands for? Of course. Yes, of course. So orthostatic hypotension is, so orthostatic means changes in position. Hypotension is a drop in blood pressure. So orthostatic hypotension means a drop in blood pressure upon moving your position, either laying down to sitting up or sitting to standing. Neurogenic orthostatic hypotension, and that's a big, big chunk of words, um, has to do with people who have a neuro, neurological, um, underlying neurological uh, problem such as Parkinson's disease or multi-system atrophy or uh, uh, dementia with Lewy body. So people with Parkinson's can have what we call NOH, which is drops in blood pressure upon sitting up from laying down to sitting up or sitting to standing. And it's defined as a drop in your blood pressure um, 20 points in the systolic. So, you know, there's two different um, numbers for your blood pressure. The top one is the systolic and the low one is the diastolic. So if there is a drop of the top one by 20 points when you stand up or 10 points of the bottom one upon standing, that can be 
neurogenic orthostatic hypotension. Um, and that's usually within three minutes of standing, but it can be even later than three minutes. And we'll probably get to that in a few minutes. And this is part of the autonomic nervous system and that right yeah. that. Mm -hmm. Can we talk a little bit about the role of the autonomic nervous system as a part of maybe a collection of issues with Parkinson's? Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. So the autonomic nervous system controls a lot of things that we don't really control. It's just sort of automatic, right? And so that autonomic nervous system can become dysfunctional and we call that autonomic dysfunction or dysautonomia. And so some of those symptoms like NO or other things, maybe perhaps you go to the gym and get your heart rate up like you used to, or you're, um, you're, you have abnormal sweating. Those types of things are dysautonomia. Other things that are associated with um, the autonomic nervous system are say constipation, um, drooling, um, uh, uh, swallowing, um, those issues. Those are all under the umbrella of the autonomic nervous system. I don't know if it's just me, but you seem to be cutting in and out a little bit. So I don't know if it's your mic or if it's the connection. All right. Well, Should we'll I take them? you posted on okay. how it is. <laughs> okay. I just don't want anyone to miss the, the words that you're saying. So, all right. So yeah, someone says she, you are cutting in and out. So I don't know. And it doesn't seem to be the video. So I think it may be the mic. So we'll, I'll keep track of it and let you know. Um, okay. All right. So you mentioned that it's, it's seen in Parkinson's, it's seen in MSA, um, in Lewy body. How common is this? Like, is this, is it more common in one of the Parkinsonisms versus another? Yes. Yeah, so it's most common in multi-system atrophy. So four out of five patients in uh, multi-system atrophy have NOH and it's about one out of five in people with Parkinson's and somewhere in the middle for the uh, uh, DLB or the dementia with Lewy body. Am I still cutting out? Uh, a tiny bit. It's, it's not as bad. Should I, should I try to take these off? Well, let's try it and see if that helps. I'm sorry. Cause I know before it was a little low, but we'll, you know, technology is great. Now they're saying we're it's all so used to it. Okay. It, and I can take it off and we can, I can re-answer the question. So it's no right, problem. You're good, right? It seems good right now. So let's just go with it. I'll keep you posted again. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. So I don't, I don't mean to, to block the flow, but anyways, so it is a little more common in MSA. And so I guess, and someone's wanting to know, is this, how serious is this to, their IPCP health. So I mean, primary care, I'm assuming is what they mean. Like, is that uh, something that the PCP question? is the one that's treating this? Is this the movement disorder specialist oh. that's evaluating so, uh, this? Maybe is what they're asking. Right. So, you know, it really just depends on the movement disorder specialist um, or the PCP. It's, it, um, I, I personally treat it. Uh, I'm the one that treats it. There are some people, the cardiologist will treat it. It just really depends on who wants to take ownership. But the, the point is, is somebody's got to treat it because this can be really dangerous. And so um, us movement disorder um, uh, neurologists know about this. This is one of the non-motor symptoms of Parkinson's and it needs to, to be addressed and needs to be treated. And we'll obviously get into how we diagnose it and, uh, and treat it in a few minutes. So let's dive into some of the symptoms um, that people might experience. So it, it may be, you know, what some people think very, you know, obvious that they might feel dizzy, but can you get into some of the various things that they might experience and how it might feel to them? 
Sure. Before I do that, I just want to explain a little bit of what happens um, so that I think that that'll help people understand what's happening. So basically when a person stands up, when we all stand up, there is pooling of our blood to the lower extremities. And when that happens, there's a reflex that automatically will send a chemical to constrict the vessels in our lower extremity. And when that happens, the blood goes up to our heart and to our brains and to the other muscles in our bodies. Well, people, some people with Parkinson's and MSA don't have enough of that neurochemical. So that blood doesn't go upward. And therefore they don't get enough of that, that blood flow to the brain and to different organs of their body. So that translates into those symptoms that can occur. So yes, of course, people can have dizziness. They may faint. Um, they may have changes in vision because they're not getting enough blood flow to the retina to, the, to, to be able to see properly. They may have chest pain if they're not getting enough oxygen to, to the chest. They may have shortness of breath if they're not having enough blood flow to the lungs. They may have uh, pain in the, the big muscles back here called the trapezius and to the neck. And we call that coat hanger pain because it kind of looks like a coat hanger. Um, now, but remember, this is all with position. So we have to remember that. That's really key in this diagnosis. It's all with position. Um, they may feel very tired. They may feel confused. And that the confusion isn't really picked up by the person, but by their care partner. They may feel um, like their legs are gonna buckle because they're not getting enough um, blood flow to the big uh, muscles in their, in their legs. So there's a lot of different symptoms that can occur with, with NOH, not just the dizziness. Interesting, someone just um, wrote that my most traumatic symptom was a feeling as though all my blood was going out the bottom of my feet and profound weakness. That's a, that's a great, um, that, that's a great analogy. And also I've heard some people say they wanted to throw up, um, you know, this profound feeling of wanting to, 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 uh, to vomit as well. Yeah. Everybody seems to have a different sort of, I had one patient who, um, would tell me that he was unable to complete his mile walk. And so as a movement disorder neurologist, I thought, okay, well, he's, he's wearing off his meds are wearing off. So I thought it was related to his dopamine, but as I continued to hear and listen to him, it turned out that it was really because he wasn't getting enough blood flow to his, um, to his legs as he was going through his walk and it was from NOH. And when I treated him, he was elated because he could go on his walk and do the things that he used to do um, once it was treated. Mm -hmm. um, so, it that fuzzy thinking is something also that other people can like, maybe it's not that they're fully, uh, you know, dizzy or even short of breath Correct. or even numby feeling, but like they can just feel like they can't think clearly. Right. They feel sort of like, but some people are like, they feel cloudy. They feel fuzzy. They just can't get get it right. Like, and, and sometimes people, their spouses will say, I don't understand why that, why is this person looking, why is my husband looking out into space when he stands up? He just doesn't look right. Um, so definitely. And that's because they're not getting enough blood to the appropriate area. Could, and that's, they're not getting enough oxygen and blood to their brain. Mm -hmm. And someone just said, well, standing at the kitchen counter, my knees will buckle. So could that potentially be an experience? Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think it's important to recognize that while the majority of people will have symptoms within three minutes, there are, there is in the literature that people can have symptoms up to 20 minutes. 
So let's say you're at Costco and you are, you know, walking around, but then in, you know, in 15 minutes, all of a sudden, or you're at the kitchen counter and then all of a sudden feeling like, oh gosh, my legs are going to buckle. That could be from the decrease in, um, in, in the blood pressure over time. I worked with a gentleman before who always complained of feeling a little bit dizzy, um, had a history of falls, and I don't know that he ever initially got diagnosed until this incident of having NOH, but um, there was a situation where he was sitting on the couch as I think his wife or somebody was in the shower. So there wasn't anyone around and somebody rang the doorbell and he got up and he, he knew to be careful, you know, get up slowly and, you know, wait a few seconds before he took off. And he, I believe used like a, a walker to kind of help him be steady, but he got halfway to the door fainted. And he, he hit so hard, he fractured his jaw and he fractured his hip. And then he ended up obviously in the hospital, unable to eat because they had to, you know, wire him shut and he was on two feeding, he deconditioned, ended up in rehab. And it started this whole like really bad cascade of events. So I know there were some questions around like not only just the length, but the risks associated with having this undiagnosed, untreated, or, you know, maybe not just the awareness of the fact that this could be a symptom of that. Absolutely. It's super incredibly important that if you're having any type of dizziness or lightheadedness or any of these symptoms upon standing, that you discuss this with your physician. And the other thing is, is, you know, I was just at one of my patients with one of my patients yesterday who was given um, her, she was given a, a blood, blood pressure pill because when she was sitting, her blood pressure was high. But when she stood up, it dropped 80 points but they never bothered to take her blood pressure standing up. So every time she, they told her, okay, well, if it's high, just take your blood pressure pill, but then you're taking a blood pressure pill and that's further dropping your blood pressure so that she would, and nobody put connected the dots. So my point is that if you're having dizziness, make sure that the person who is treating you not only takes your blood pressure sitting, but that they take it standing up because that's where you see the difference. It has to be taken sitting and standing. That's where we make the diagnosis, where we see that drop in blood pressure upon standing. It's very, very important. And to your point, so if anybody is having any symptoms like this, don't think, oh, well, it's just a little bit of dizziness. It'll go away or it can lead to really to mortality. If you think about your, your patient, you know, who's going to think, yeah, I'm going to fall. I'm going to break my jaw. I'm not going to be able to eat. I'm going to have a hip fracture. And we know people don't die of PD. They die of things like that, right? Like the hip fracture, being in a hospital, the things that we don't want our patients to do is be in a hospital with Parkinson's and that leads to the demise. And so it's, it's, you're not, complaining, you've got to talk to to someone and make sure that if you're having these symptoms that they test you test to sit sitting down and standing up because I cannot tell you how many stories I've heard. You go to the ER and they take your blood pressure sitting, but you fainted. That's not good enough. They have to do it sitting and standing. And you know, you you are all veterans here. You've been on this a, a million times be your own advocate and make sure that someone takes that blood pressure standing up so that they can see the drop if there is one, or at least rule it out. And is that the main way of diagnosing it is just doing the- Yes, and that is- That is exactly right. So we do the positions, you know, usually we'll do laying down and then sitting up and then standing up. But if you are in, you know, dire straits, you could do sitting down and standing up within three minutes. And the other thing is people with NOH, their blood pressures will not change. I mean, excuse me, their heart rates will not change. They usually stay about the same. 
Whereas someone who's dehydrated, when you stand up, the heart rate will jump up. That's not true in NOH. So in NOH, you're going to have your blood pressure will be whatever it is and you stand up and that blood pressure will drop, but the heart rate will remain about the same. Can and you, that's the diagnosis. Can you have NOH without symptoms? Yes, you can. So some people, and this is not uncommon actually, especially early on, um, they will have, they will have blood pressure drops and NOH that is asymptomatic, but over time, something will tip them over whether, so there are certain triggers to, to NOH that's heat. And I see some of these coming yes, through. Yes. <laughs> heat is, uh, heat is definitely. So when it's heat, when it's hot outside, when it's, um, when there's a lot of humidity, if you go into a sauna, the morning hours are usually when people tend to have more symptoms. High carbo carbohydrates um, are another thing that will drop blood pressure. Alcohol will drop blood pressure. So these are all important things when we put, try to put together the puzzle, pieces of the puzzle with people with Parkinson's. And then another thing too, is that everybody is so different. So I've had people walk into my office with a systolic blood pressure of 70 and they're not fainting because some people's brains get used to it. Whereas there's people who are at, they know they're going to faint if their systolic blood pressure is 90. So everybody's numbers are different too. Yeah. And that was going to be my question because some people might tend to already be on the lower end. And so they might not have as dramatic, maybe of a change Correct. to the pressures, but still symptom have the symptoms. So that's possible. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And there was some questions around um, a couple of them kind of similar, like does like certain behaviors maybe create problems. You, you already mentioned like heat and hydration, but can it drop after eating a meal? Definitely. Yes, that is definitely postprandial hypotension. So people's blood pressure will drop after eating. That's another thing that can happen. Yes, definitely. And I can't, I, I can't um, underscore the importance of hydration. Now, I've been doing this for 17 years and nobody wants to drink water because nobody wants to go to the bathroom, but it's very, 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 very important. People must drink water, 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 water. And especially the first half of the day. And if it's okay with your cardiologist to add salt to your diet, especially in the morning. So if you're hearing me, most things happen in the morning, in the morning to the first half of the day, that's when people tend to have symptoms. So you want to hydrate, hydrate, hydrate in the first half of the day, specifically um, in the winter times, having like soup because it has a lot of salt. V8 juice is another thing that is good to increase your salt um, and to help that blood pressure stay up. And we, we put that under the the sort of non-pharmacologic ways to help people with increasing their blood pressure. Um, and it really is a lot of education and lifestyle changes. And that's that has to be your way and part of your lifestyle moving forward. Because once people start to slip from that, they start to have their symptoms again. So it's very important that everybody is on board with having the hydration and making sure they're not having huge carbohydrate meals, having smaller meals a few times a day can help as well. And if someone is diagnosed with NOH, does, is that something they need to like see a cardiologist about or if they have a cardiologist, let them know. I know somebody was saying, you know, who all needs to be informed of this, especially if they've been treating high blood pressure. Um, who makes a decision on how things are <laughs> handled? So that's a really good question. So the, the hope is that the movement disorder neurologist and the cardiologist will work in tandem. Some people need to be on antihypertensive or blood pressure medications for other reasons. They may need it for their heart. They may need it for their kidneys. 
And so what we do is call the doctor and say, listen, I understand that, you know, you know, Betty needs her medication for her kidneys, but can I put it, can, can we switch it to evening time so that she doesn't have symptoms in the morning? Um, or is it possible that we can maybe even cut the dose now so she doesn't have symptoms of low blood pressure? Uh, we don't like stepping on people's toes, that's for sure. But we also want safety and we don't want people, you know, nobody wants that. Nobody wants our patients, you know, fainting and falling, obviously. Um, and so that that's the, the route in which we, we do those types of things. So if a person has to have a blood pressure medication, we definitely want to, to, to switch it over to the evening hours and not too, too late because if it's a long acting blood pressure medication, it can affect you in the morning when you're already apt to having low blood pressures. So that's something we could take into consideration as well. Yeah. And, you know, there was questions about, you know, does it happen? Can it happen if I'm not even standing? Like if I'm just sitting, can I, can I experience that? Um, and then not unless you have a change in your position. Okay. So there needs to be a change in position. Yeah, that's key. It's position, position, position. That's definitely key. All right. Yeah. Um, and I just want to um, have a caveat too about the blood pressure medicines. So it's very common in the United States that people are on blood pressure medicines. I mean, most people can be on them, but over time, even without NOH, people's blood pressure with Parkinson's tends to start to get lower and lower. And we see that over time, the person may not even need that, that blood pressure pill anymore. So, so it's something that we all need to do our due diligence to look at your medication lists to see, do you need this medicine? And that's another thing. Some medication can contribute to drops in blood pressure, not just the blood, not just the antihypertensives, but there are some other medications that can contribute to drops in blood pressure. So we look at your blood, at your medication list to make sure that we're not aggravating the situation with some of these medications that, that we or other doctors are giving you. And we've had a couple questions about supine hypertension. What if you also have that? Is that a treatment dilemma? And then do you know if supine hypertension is a good or bad thing? Any studies? Yeah, so great question. So supine hypertension is when a person is laying down and their blood pressure is high. So supine means laying down and hypertension <laughs> means high blood pressure. So 70% of people with NOH have supine hypertension, um, just to make it more complicated. So, um, but so what we, in our education of this condition, we want you all to know that 70% people will have that. So people with NOH need to sleep with the head of the bed at 30 degrees. So sleeping at, with your head in the bed at 30 degrees can help decrease that supine hypertension. And that goes even for napping. We don't, there's no more flat sleeping anymore if you have NOH, because that can lead to, um, to stroke, God forbid, if your blood pressure is too high when you're laying down. So it really is dangerous if you have NOH and you're sleeping flat um, because of that, that risk of supine hypertension. We had a couple of questions around medications that might actually cause NOH or OH. Um, so one person had asked earlier, much earlier about um, can carbidopa levodopa uh, contribute to a drop in blood pressure and then are there other medications that are not even Parkinson specific that people might need to be considering as watch outs that could potentially cause NOH or OH? Yes, yes. So some of the medications for bladder can drop people's blood pressure. Some of the Parkinson's medications can drop blood pressure. Carbidopa levodopa at high doses can, if a person is you know, heading in that direction. 
Um, the, the immediate release dopamine agonists have been known to drop blood pressure. So, and then things that we don't, you know, not necessarily for, for, um, for Parkinson's would be like the bladder ones. Um, some of the antidepressants can drop blood pressure. So it's really important that your doctor, whoever's treating the NOH, look at your medication list to make sure that there's not um, some aggravating medications on there that we can switch you over to something else. For example, if you're on an immediate release dopamine agonist, we can put you on an extended release dopamine agonist and make that NOH better. So it's those spikes that tend to make, give people problems too, or switch you over to another bladder medication that may not have that type of uh, side effect. Awesome. And you talked a little bit about um, some of the non-pharmacological treatments, hydration, hydration, obviously. You also hydration, mentioned hydration. like V8 juice. Um, and a person wanted to know, are Gatorade or Pedialyte good options also to help increase blood pressure in the morning? They are, they are, but you want to be careful in terms of the sugar content because sugar can contribute to drops of blood pressure. So if you're going to do that, you want to do a G2, which has less sugar. Um, you definitely, um, you know, definitely don't want to do juices. Juices have so much sugar that that will contribute to drops in blood pressure. So stay away from juices. Um, but yes, G2 can, propel would be fine as well. Um, and then definitely something salty like a V8 or tomato juice. Tomato juice would be the only caveat in terms of juice. Um, that would be fine. And then also um, abdominal binders. So it's like a corset. And I know nobody wants to wear those, but those are very effective. Um, you can get them on Amazon. And what they do is they constrict the big um, vessels in your torso to help increase that uh, that blood upwards. Other things are compression stockings, which um, everyone really loves, I'm sure. Um, but they are hard to get on. They do have zippered ones now that you could get. And then other things that are, it's really a matter of training. Um, and that is lifting your legs up. Like if you're sitting down and you're marching prior to standing. So that's an effort to get your, your um, your legs and your big muscles moving prior to standing. And the other thing is squeezing your buttocks muscles prior to getting up because those are bigger muscles and that will help to, to get the blood flowing upwards. And how about pharmacological treatments? Are there options for that? There are. So, um, so droxydopa or Northera is a medication that's FDA approved for this condition. Um, so that's utilized. Midodrine is another medication that's utilized for it. Um, and then some people use mestinon or uh, pertostigmine. And then atomoxetine is another one that is uh, used, as is Florineth. Mm -hmm. And as far as people like home monitoring, are home blood pressure monitors reliable? Should people be taking their blood pressures or leave that to their doctors? Is that something they want a diary of? Well, your doctor may want a diary of it. And what I would, my advice is don't like get so consumed that you're taking it, you know, every hour or every day for a month or, you know, unless your doctor recommends that. But Beware of one thing, the blood pressure is going to jump up and down. And our goal in treating NOH is not to have perfect blood pressure because that's not going to happen. You're, the people with NOH are not going to be 120 over 70. But what we want is for you not to have symptoms. That's the goal. So you may find that you, when you're sitting, it may be elevated. Um, but what we don't want is when you stand and it drops and you feel dizzy or you have some other symptom of it. Um, and you'll see that there will be some fluctuations, but you know, don't be too afraid of that. Um, and when, you, when you're sitting and you see a very high 
you know, blood pressure, simply standing could be enough to get that. If you stand slowly, could be enough to get that lowered. And if it's low and you're symptomatic, a big glass of water and drinking that very quickly can be enough to get that high enough for you to, to feel better. So there are ways around um, without having to call, you know, the um, paramedics and such. Um, yeah, and, and then in terms of whether they're reliable, the the yeah. uh, cuffs. So, you know, you want to see, take it to your doctor and see calibrate it against that. And then again, it's the drop. It's the amount of drop. That, that we're looking for, not the exact number. And somebody wanted to know like, how effective are the meds? Are there any medications that are probably more effective than others? And I'm sure there's like multiple factors in deciding which medications are for whom, but what would you say to whether it actually does benefit the, the symptoms? Well, the only one, um, so droxydopa is the one that was FDA approved and went through, you know, clinical studies for this. Um, there, each one's got its own side effect profile and whatnot. Um, and then ultimately it looks, um, you know, it's up to, to the doctor on what they feel comfortable with utilizing. Some people have su such drops and so, much, so many symptoms that they need to be on multiple uh, medications. So it really just depends on the person and what their symptoms are. And another person wanted to know about like Apple watches, sports watches, other devices for monitoring blood pressure. Do those help? I know we, we're, we're getting more uh, tech savvy with our phones and I know a lot of them are now monitoring Parkinson's symptoms. So how about this aspect? Yeah, I mean, I, I understand that, you know, Apple Watch is looking at blood pressure and such, but again, we, unless it's going to monitor position, because remember, this is all about position. So unless it can help you like, okay, I, and I don't know the answer to that. So, but if, if, if you can find out if it's going to um, look at your blood pressure sitting and then take it for you standing and have an accurate assessment of that, then that's fine. But if it's just going to give you an overview that, you know, at such and such time you were 120 over 70, that's not going to be really helpful for you. And again, I don't know the answer to that, whether it does or does not. So I'm curious, is there any correlation at all with NOH with certain types, subtypes of Parkinson's? Like if somebody is a terminal dominant type or someone who might be more of the postural gait instability type, is there anyone in any groups that seem to have more susceptibility? Not that I know of that I have read it in the literature. Uh, the only, you know, the correlations of who has it more are, you know, the MSA, then the group after that would be the DLB, and then the group after that would be the Parkinson's. Okay. But it, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I know some of these questions are hard, but um, it's a really good conversation. And I'm trying to make sure I'm not missing any of them. I know somebody was asking about all the list of the, the medications and there's, you mentioned several of them, there are a lot, a lot. So I, I don't know. I'm sorry. But, I can... I can repeat them. Okay. So we'll try to we'll yeah. try to type them out as you say them. <laughs> sure. So it's droxydopa, the other the other name for it, Northera. Mm -hmm. Um. Then there's midodrin. Um. Then there is fluorineth. Sorry, I didn't um, put it on a slide. That's okay. And I'm probably not spelling these right. <laughs> no, you are. You are. Florineph. And I should say to Florineph, Florineph is once a day. And Florineph is a volume expander. So it expands the volume in a person's body, Florineph. Um, 
And then there is Mestinon, M-E-S-T-I-N-O-N. There you go. And there is, that's four, right? Yes. Okay. And then there's Atomoxetine, A-T-O-M-O-X-E-T-I-N-O-N. Did I get that right? There you go. Yeah. Okay, maybe. <laughs> my attempts. All right. So hopefully that'll be helpful. You guys can save your chat or copy and paste that into um, a note or a, a word document. So you'll have that and you can ask your doctor. So is there any suggestions that you have to people like if their doctor hasn't already like asked them or started to assess whether this is an issue with them? I mean, aside from saying I'm feeling dizzy, is there any way that they could be um, you know, able to open up that communication and kind of help, you know, move a, a conversation along to get an assessment? Yeah. So I would really, um, I would really try to think about whether your or your loved one is having any symptoms with position that tend to occur more often in the morning hours or the first half of the day that are either dizziness, lightheadedness, um, changes in vision, um, this sort of uh, coat hanger pain, cognitive changes when the person stands up. So remember, this is all related to position. Um, fatigue, a lot of fatigue. If you guys go to, you know, the mall to walk and then all of a sudden feeling very fatigued or tired, could it be related to the, to the blood pressure? Um, the leg buckling. Uh, so it, I, I encourage you to think about these things when it's happening, particularly God bless you. If it's happening, um, when, in not within, you know, three minutes of standing, is it happening within 15 minutes of standing or when you're walking for a, a, a certain amount of time? And then I would say, you know what, I, you know, my loved one has Parkinson's um, and I'm wondering if this might be related to NOH, neurogenic orthostatic hypotension. Can you please check a sitting and a standing um, blood pressure? And make sure that your loved one doesn't drink a bunch of water prior to going into the office so it doesn't skew it up. But um, yeah, I, and I think there's no harm in that. And, and it's important. The sitting and standing is very important. Just checking a sitting blood pressure is not going to, to help the diagnosis at all. And you don't want to wait until a person has fainted. You just don't. That's just, it's too bad if that happens. Yeah. It really, really is. And we had a question about best time of day to take this blood pressure at home. Like obviously what? whatever best time of day for checking the blood pressures. I think you mentioned morning, but I just wanted to. Morning. Yeah. Morning. Yeah. So and it is very, you know, one of those things that might seem obvious for some and less obvious for others. Like I shared the gentleman, you know, who was up a couple of minutes by the time he got to the door. You mentioned somebody even up to 20 minutes, I believe you had mentioned that can experience this. And so you might brush it off as something else. Um, so it's important to know that that could be a potential. And then I was just curious because I know that there's like the fuzzy thinking that can come with that but in speaking to of correlations is there any correlation to this in cognitive changes yes yes there is at when it's happening not like long term although there can be long term the more and more that this occurs long term effects can occur because you're not perfusing your brain but yes cognitive absolutely because you're just not able to respond and so the person isn't with it so absolutely there is uh huh yeah and um it it's it really really is quite an important um, important non-motor symptom that, that should be looked at and should be evaluated. 
And I think I just said, saw someone say that their doctor has never taken their blood pressure standing up. And um, everybody has to have it sitting and standing. Um, so if it's not happening, and if, if you have any of these symptoms, I would ask if they could kindly take your blood pressure standing up as well. And if you, if that's not happening, then, and you have a blood pressure cuff at home, then I would recommend that you do your own sitting and then wait for two minutes or three minutes and stand up and, and take, take your standing up. And then, you know, you can report that back to your physician or your healthcare provider. Yeah, someone said, our cardi cardiologist said, take it laying down first, wait two minutes, take it sitting, wait two minutes and take it standing. Yes, that's perfect. That's, that's when a person has a lot of time and um, when a physician has a lot of time or health care provider, that's exactly what you do. Lay down and then sit up for two to three minutes and then stand up for two to three minutes. That's perfect, yes. And I know we talked about the, the digital cups, but I will tell you personally, when I go into the doctor's office and they take my blood pressure with the digital monitor, I get a completely different reading than if they take it with the manual or analog or whatever the, 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 uh, the right term is. Is there a better way for them to do it or does it just matter at all just as long as they're getting a reading? I mean, typically it is better if it's manual, but a lot of places don't have manual ones anymore. Um, and by and large, the, the automatic ones tend to, they seem to be a little bit on the higher side than, than not. Um, but, you know, and there's only so much we can control. But again, remember what we're looking for really when we're the doctors is not so much what's the blood pressure, but what's the drop, right? Because we want to see when I stand up, does my blood pressure drop 20 or 10 on the low, uh, the bottom one or both? And this person's wanting to know, <laughs> after fainting and calling an EMT, if, uh, if all is okay, should they always go to the hospital? No, I'm <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> That's up to your doctor. <laughs> um, that's totally up to your doctor. I mean, if you're fainting and, you know, and you haven't had a cardiac workup, um, maybe, you, you know, people should have a cardiac workup uh, just to make sure it's not an arrhythmia um, at least once. Um, but by and large, I mean, I've had patients who this would happen so much that the spouse would be like, no, we're not going, we're done. Um, we know why this is happening. One of my patients just happened to her at the gym and they were telling her she's got to go to the hospital. She's like, I'm not going. I will, I know why this happened. I haven't drank enough water. I'm deconditioned because she had a hip replacement and she was out for the count for a long time. And she told them, I'm, I won't go, um, but that's her. And she knew what she had and she's had a full cardiac workup. So, you know, it really just depends on the situation. Yeah. And if they hit their head. <laughs> yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. 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 Definitely. Um, and I'm, I'm just going through these because I, I know you talked about the shortness of breath. So is a feeling of not being able to catch your breath. I mean, it's the same thing, like just having a hard time getting the breath is, is part, maybe part of that. It may be. Yeah, okay. it, it may be. Mm -hmm. All right. And then um, my doctor instructed me to not even bother taking my reading sitting anymore. Why would that be? if they're experiencing this, is that, is it, is it just upon the standing then if somebody's definitely having this? Um, that'd be hard because you need something to compare it with. So if you just took it standing, I mean, how would you know if it dropped if you didn't have something to compare it with? So I'm not really sure you might wanna ask your doctor can NOH be intermittent, meaning can they only have it every so often and not a consistent problem? 
Y yes, it definitely can. So in the summer months, when I practiced in Florida, we saw uh, so many people have so many more symptoms. And then in the winter, it was better. Um, so definitely with the ant with the environment that definitely can trigger, um, trigger more symptoms, and then it can get better in the winter months. Um, and then, def you know, diet, and if people drink alcohol, or if they're in saunas, um, so it, it just, it can, it can get better. And remember that, you know, if you are diagnosed, and you follow the non pharmacological um, uh, treatments, then that may be enough to, to get rid to, to improve the situation for a very long time. So Awesome. Well, I think you have really covered like all of the aspects of what to consider as far as symptoms and the importance of, of you know, checking that blood pressure, sitting and standing and waiting. Um, any other pointers or any other thoughts um, that we haven't covered at this point in the questions? I just want to touch upon the a couple of things um you know certainly if you're having symptoms from sitting to standing make sure that you bring this to to the attention of your healthcare provider remember noh is not only dizziness or lightheadedness that it can be these other symptoms the leg buckling the confusion the visual you know um the visual symptoms that people have um and so that, that's really important. Um, and then make sure that if you do faint uh, or you're taken to an ER or urgent care or the EMTs come to you, that they take your blood pressure sitting and standing of how many times. Um, and the other thing, yeah, there's one other thing. So if you are, um, if you are admitted to the hospital for fainting, and you're stuck in a hospital bed and they're checking your blood pressure and you're sitting in the bed for days upon days upon days. Oh, your blood pressure is great now because we gave you fluids, this, that, and the other. Have them check it standing also <laughs> because you wanna make sure the more one stays in bed, the more deconditioned you get. So you wanna make sure that you are good enough to go, not just because they gave you a bunch of fluid, but also that they checked your blood pressure sitting and standing and you don't go home and have the same problem. And I think some of the things that you point out also is, you know, taking into consideration, especially the example you gave of the lady who had been deconditioned from a hip fracture, was just getting back to the gym, wasn't hydrated enough. So there are things that, you know, besides medications that people can be doing to kind of help it, but also to be aware of, you know, whether you are weak, if you're just getting over a sickness and you don't yeah. hold yourself, like that needs to be considered in maybe taking extra precautions. Yes, absolutely. And on the flip side, you know, some, some people are so excited that yay, they can finally walk after their hip replacement or whatever. And then the, the first thing they want to do is just jump right out of the chair, but your body isn't ready to jump out of the chair because you, your body's not used to it yet. They're deconditioned. And so you got to take things slowly and wait. Your, your big muscles have to be ready to be, you know, strengthened up again to, to be able to handle that, all the perfusion and such. So, yeah. Right. So if you all are getting out of a hot tub or you've been in oh. your hot tub and you might have had a cocktail while you're in the hot tub, something to consider too. <laughs> Somebody just made that. Oh, most point. certainly. Yes. Yes, most certainly. Most certainly. Absolutely. That's a recipe for for definitely having symptomatology. Yeah. Awesome. Well, Dr. Broman, thank you so much for reviewing this. I just can't Thank you enough how it's so important for people to understand this. And, you know, even though we talk about it, there's still a lot of confusion. So I know we didn't answer everyone's questions. Some of them are kind of specific, but I think overall you've done such a great job of answering these and giving us a broad view, understanding of NOH and what the symptoms might look like, some things they can do. 
uh, from their own personal standpoint, behaviorally and, and non-pharmacologically, as well as some options. So fantastic review. And I I want to invite everybody to give you the thanks, the wave of gratitude. You know the wave of gratitude. We've given you that before, <laughs> but it, it's it's still important, and I still love sharing that with you. So thank you. We all thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. I, I appreciate it. Thank you, everyone. Take care and drink water, please. <laughs> yes, it's hot out there. So take care, everybody. Take care. Bye. Bye. Thanks.